sex or your reason was referred to it as the gender that you were assigned at birth. And the sex of your body is very much to do with kind of like your biology, your anatomy around your hormones. So like testosterone, estrogen, whichever is more kind of present in your body will have a huge impact on how your body develops. Your sex chromosomes around your X and Y chromosomes, um, which is the end of what I know about chromosomes. So <laughs> please no questions on that. Um, your reproductive organs, and then of course your external genitalia as well. So all of these kind of come together to create the sort of the sex of your body. Um, and as I said, we sometimes, would refer to this as the gender that you were assigned at birth to try to call attention to the way that when you were, were all born as babies, um, your parents or nurses or midwives or doctors or whoever's there looks at you and usually based on your external genitalia as an infant makes an assumption that you are either boy or girl um, and then everybody is raised as either boys or girls. And gender is a really important way in how we socialize children from a really young age in terms of the kinds of um, clothes that we give to, you know, to, to children, the toys that we give to children, the ways that we expect them to behave. And gender is a key way that children come to learn to um, understand themselves in, in terms of their own personality and, and their own kind of internal sense of self, but then also their relationship with other people as well. So it begins much earlier than um, any kind of understanding around sexual orientation or attraction, um, which is the last piece which is a little harsh so we also want to be really clear that the way the way that you your your gender works is very different to the way that your sexual orientation works because your sexual orientation or your attraction is to other people and then your sense of gender is to do with like your sense of yourself um, and your experience of yourself as well and we often talk about them at the same time in terms of you know um even terms like, like, like terms like lesbian, for example, would describe like a woman typically who is attracted to other women. And we tend to talk about like your gender and the gender of the people that you are attracted to in the same term sometimes. And um, but they are two very distinct um, processes as well. Does anybody have any questions at this point? About chromosomes. No, not about chromosomes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, perfect. Okay, we'll go to the slide. Um, so just in terms of a little bit of more language around all of this, um, I'm going to talk about this slide for some more. So if your gender identity and uh, the biological sex of your body or the gender that you were assigned at birth are the same, we would probably describe you as cisgender. So cisgender means that those two things are the same. So say you were born and everybody was like this child seems like a or infant seems like a boy, raised you as a boy, and then and now you identify as a man, you would probably describe it as cisgender. And that's like, like 90 whatever percent of the population. Um, but if those two things are not the same, so if your gender identity is different to the gender that you were assigned at birth, or again, the, the biological sex of your body, we would probably describe you as transgender. And transgender is an adjective that describes a whole range of different ways of being and um, that come under the, the umbrella. So we have on the slide trans man, for example, is somebody who um, identifies as male, but who was assigned to female at birth, which means that when that child was born, um, you know, everybody looked at the baby and thought this seems like a girl and, and raised that child's baby as a girl. And then at some point, really like anywhere from like early childhood, maybe like around the age of like three or four, would kind of be the earliest we might see it up to. 80. 80, you know, there's no over age limit, exactly, yeah. And um, that person might come to identify more as a man and to, and to express that in, in whatever way. Um, and so we would probably describe that person as a trans man. And then the opposite then would be a trans woman, so someone who identifies as female, whose gender was assigned male at birth. And you'll notice in those two terms that um, two things, transgender is an adjective, which is really important. So we would describe, like transgender is a, is a, is a way of being. It's not, we wouldn't describe somebody as like a transgender full stop. Um, and we also, the man and woman part of those terms describes the gender that the person identifies with, not the biological sex of their body, not the gender that they were assigned at birth, because for us, the gender identity is always the most important piece because it's to do with who you are as a person, that part of your personality, your like internal sense of self, all of that. And we think it's, it's really important to honor that um, in the words that we use to describe people. And um, also under the trans umbrella, we have non-binary um, and non-binary, is fun. So the, the the sort of binary part of the term um is around the idea that there are like 
uh, two genders, male and female, and non-binary is like anybody who identifies outside of that, which might be like a third other sense of gender, or it might be no sense of gender at all, or it might be a, a type of gender identity that can change over time. It's kind of anything outside of like strictly male or strictly female. Um, and I identify as non-binary. And in my personal life, I love the term non-binary because I think it's so like vague, it's so open to interpretation. It means different things to different people. I think it's wonderful in that way. In my professional life, I find it kind of frustrating because it's hard to explain to people. Um, but hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you. Um, and just to say that non-binary um, is currently the most popular term for like anything outside of male or female, but language comes in that fashion all the time. Um, and there would have been other words that were more common in the past, particularly genderqueer, even like maybe 10 or 20 years ago, genderqueer would have been much more in fashion than non-binary is now. I don't know how or why things come in and out of fashion, but just know that they do. Um, and within that, it's a good idea to know the most common words that people are using. There are like literally hundreds of more ones, and I don't... I can't put them all in a slide and I also don't know them all myself and I'm a professional trans person so don't, worry <laughs> if you don't know them all yourself um <laughs> exactly. a lot of them depend by culture too yeah 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 exactly like so like non-binary is what we're using now here but I think in other cultures there's there's other ones even even in other English-speaking countries there's other words that are more common so all that in mind I think what I really like to say around this slide is like if you are with someone and they are describing themselves in language that you were not familiar with, it's okay to ask them what that is in a way that is respectful and you know doesn't put them on the spot too much. Um, but I think people are really nervous around asking questions around this kind of stuff, and it's okay to to do that. Um, lastly, on the side, also we have intersex. So intersex is kind of bringing us back to the sort of the biology anatomy piece, and intersex describes a whole range of different. I guess kind of medical conditions where your physical sex characteristics are different from what we would typically think of as male or female. So that might be if you have a different combination of X, Y chromosomes, um, or you have maybe like hormone imbalances or um, you know reproductive organs and, and genitalia that maybe are different from what we would typically maybe expect. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of crossover between people who are intersex and people who are transgender. They're not like, it's not like a one for one thing at all. And um, in the same way that um, people who are not intersex have a relationship with their body and with their sense of self, so do intersex people. And um, we have a lot of shared struggle in terms of particularly around like medical anatomy or agency and stuff and um, autonomy. And um, so we do a lot of work with the intersex community, but it's not like, we're not like a reason. Right, some can be cisgender and yeah. intersex yeah. because based on their external genitalia, someone could sign the female birth and then they could agree with that identity later in life. Yeah, yeah, and it also you could be you can totally you can also be intersex. Like it means loads of different things. So you can be intersex and be completely unaware of this until maybe puberty, or maybe until you want to have children, or maybe like forever. Um, and it's also kind of broad as well. Like even things like um like more like really common things like polycystic ovarian syndrome is sometimes included in intersex and so on. like it's all very changeable and all of that is true for, for all of these words so like the other thing is that like people may or may not identify with terms um particularly around like trans men and trans women i think might identify really strongly say at some point in their life as a transgender man and then maybe later on might have just feel that like he's a man the same as any other man so it's all on a person to person basis as well all of these things are resist categorization even as we try to categorize them. So just be conscious of that too. Is there any questions on any on any of this English? Sometimes I'm really conscious when I come to, to do talks like this, that this is maybe the first time that people have heard the word transgender spoken out loud. Um, and I just want to say that and to say that this is really valuable, I think, to get used to the language and hearing the language. And it's not a bad word. Um, Can I just say something? Um, and I really appreciate your clarity, mm -hmm. and I, I understand you, but there's a process of like getting mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. and feeling comfortable for me to actually be yeah. in the yeah. zone with oh, you. Yes. yes. Um, and the other thing about it's okay to ask. I kind of feel like I need to say to somebody, is it okay to ask? Mm -hmm. But my sense is some people are just tired yeah. of explaining. Yeah. And it's like, no, actually. Yeah. Let's get on with one year. Yes. So I thought it's kind of yes. 
Um, yes, just for folks online, um, we just have a, a comment around um, it being okay to ask or, or why it's not okay to ask. And I think absolutely, I mean, I suppose it's all context specific, I guess. Like if you're having a, like a, a heart to heart with a close personal friend, you might feel more okay to ask them like, what does that mean for you? Or like, what does that look like? Or like, you know, whatever. If it's in a more maybe reserved or even like a professional context, it might not be the time to ask. But then also, as you said, people can get tired of explaining for sure. And I think asking, even trying to ask in a way that leaves it open for the person to be like, no, you can Google that later, you know, it's, <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah, so being really conscious, I think, of people's boundaries as well um, and, and all that sort of stuff, so yeah, thank you. Um, and then in terms of this habit side, so um, I wonder why I'm blocking, oh no, you can see all the things. Um, so when we talk about who is and isn't trans, um, we tend to talk a lot about this thing called gender dysphoria, um, which is a term that describes the distress, the mental distress that somebody might feel when their gender identity is different to their gender assigned at birth or their biological sex, um, and is kind of particularly rooted in the idea of having a body that you don't want to have, that you feel maybe doesn't express who you are, um, it maybe is developing in a way that you don't want it to develop, um, and also to do very much to do with how people are perceiving you as well. So like if you're going out in the world and people are constantly calling you sir or ma'am or you know whatever, and that is, is really difficult for you, and um, you might be experiencing gender dysphoria. Um, it is a term that was developed within um, specifically the American psychiatric kind of uh, arena or whatever, um, and it's used as a diagnosis. So if you are a trans person and you want to access um, specifically trans healthcare or gender affirming healthcare, you need to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And so it's very much used as a benchmark within the psychiatric uh, association area um, to decide who is and isn't trans, is whether or not people are experiencing, to what degree people are experiencing this level of like mental and emotional distress to do with their body and their social gender. Um, obviously it's quite a negative term and it really, at the, it, it kind of implies that the core of being trans is having this like, really negative relationship with yourself and with others and how people perceive you and all that kind of stuff. And we are, certainly I think more recently trying to move a little bit away from that within the community and instead of talking about that quite so much but to also talk about gender euphoria which is the exact opposite so when anytime you have like a really powerful positive experience relating to your gender you might experience gender euphoria so um like if uh like if you change your name for example if people started calling you by that name you might experience gender euphoria or you take on the appearance of different external sexual organs yeah yeah or you or you just like put on an outfit that you really like and you look in the mirror and you're like i look great today that might be gender you forget any of that kind of stuff so um and it's, it's a term that was created much more within kind of the trans and, and, and gender diverse community and i think it tries to put at the core again much more of the like positive joy and like affirmation that there can be in like expressing yourself in an authentic way and which I think is really, really valuable to try and talk about. But then also in terms of how we decide who is and isn't trans is to move away from this idea that in order to be trans, you have to be like almost at this like rock bottom, like super dark place. And that to say, actually, you don't need to be experiencing, if you are experiencing that, you know, that's that's tough and, and you know, whatever. But also like, you don't need to be experiencing that. And if it makes you happy to express yourself in a different way, that's fine. And like, that's enough of a reason. And you don't need to be, Kind of in this really dark place but you can also just do the things that make you happy and um, without having to come from a place of like really 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 needing to make change or anything like that um, and i would certainly see that a lot particularly um with, with with other people who say to me like oh you know i'd love to use a they them pronoun or like i'd love to change my name but i just i don't i don't like need it that much or like i don't want to take it away from people who do need it or whatever and it's like hey it's not a finite resource um <laughs> firstly <laughs> you can have whatever name you want and it doesn't matter um, and it'll also be like it's okay like you don't need to be in this really intense emotional space you can just do the things that make you happy. Especially when we're talking about gender fluidity yeah. you may be you may feel more comfortable with different types of ex expression on different days or in different situations. Yeah. Gender euphoria is just about your presentation as it is in a moment matching the presentation that you want yeah. to the outside world. Yeah. 
Any questions? Cool. Let's all go find some Jenny for you. Um, so in terms of how common it is to be trans, uh, sorry, I'm blocking the slide up here, but hopefully you can mostly see it. Um, huge grain of salt with this. Um, we are estimating that about 1% of the population might be uh, gender diverse or experience some form of gender variance, um, which is another term in which they have some kind of like gender funkiness going on. <laughs> That's the technical language for you. Um, all of that is, that's kind of, uh, any data we have around that comes from like polls and surveys and that sort of thing. It, it, we don't have any population level data on how common it is to be LGBT, specifically around how common it is to be trans. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, polls and surveys are done in different ways in different places and the methodologies and all that kind of stuff. Um, in but again, if we're if we're estimating about one percent of, of the population, there might be about forty nine thousand people in Ireland, um, and in Trinity student population, there would be about one hundred eighty people, um, which I love that that that's in there. Um, the other thing is that within that, we're we're generally seeing that um of the people who experience some form of gender variance, only about a third of them will express that in any way, um, only about a third would maybe. You know, maybe change a name, maybe change a pronoun, or like change their outward appearance, or do any kind of transition. We call it, um, partly maybe because they don't want to, partly maybe because it's quite hard to do that. Um, but just being conscious, I guess, of the numbers. And I think sometimes you would be uh, forgiven for believing if you're looking at the national media that like we're having this huge numbers of transgender people in Ireland and um, people who want to transition but um, we're actually looking at a really tiny percentage of the population and um, interestingly it's also it's about as common it's about the same in terms of being trans and being intersex and it's also um, about the same and um, which is also about as common as it is to have red hair which I think is fun in terms of in terms of um, I mean, specifically, I guess, the ways that people with red hair are part of the national imagination in Ireland, um, and the way that trans and intersex people are not part of the national imagination in Ireland. Um, but I just, I, I find it useful sometimes to put things um, in, in, in context like that, I guess. So, um, but again, huge grain of salt with it all. I think there was actually a recent, a poll came out today, I think the Nipsos poll and maybe in the States, that's found that like something like 50% of Gen Z are identifying as LGBTQ broadly. But it depends where you take that uh, poll and in what communities. Yeah. So there's no, especially for things that are so based on where you are in your identity, it's very difficult to get specific numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And also all these things resist categorization. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. If it's helpful to think about that, great. If it's not helpful, you can forget about it. And this is a photo from Dublin Trans Pride. Yeah. Not just Dublin Pride, but... A uh, Dublin Pride event celebrating trans and intersex people. Yeah. Yep. So, in terms of scale, in your imagination, yep. there is definitely a presence of trans people in Dublin and also from Trinity. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. Like in terms of having an administrative question, how easy or difficult is it in Ireland? If you want to say change your pronouns on your passport or your driver's license, or you know those kind of things, yeah. how do you get to that? So, first of your pronouns are not on your passport. Oh, your gender, your gender, yeah, 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 totally. So, um. Sorry, so just the question was around how easy it is to um legally change your gender and then update your passport and IDs and stuff. Yeah. So the um you do that under this thing called the Gender Recognition Act and legislation, and it is very easy, relatively easy, um, to change your name and to change your gender from male to female or female to male. You do it by applying for this thing called the gender recognition search, which is like a form that you print out, you fill it out. You have it signed, you have it witnessed, and you have it signed, like notarized, um, and you send it off to the Department of Social Protection. They send you back a thing called gender recognition search. It's pretty much free, except you might have to pay someone to notarize it, like maybe 10 or 15 euros. And um, at the minute, I think it's taken maybe two months or so to do it. Um, it's not so bad. And then when you get that gender recognition cert back, you can use it to get a new passport. And then you basically would use your passport to do whatever, to like do driving, 
license and all the rest of that stuff. So it's very straightforward. Um, it takes a little bit of time. You know, the money, obviously, the new passport is 80 euro. Um, it takes a little bit of time to get a new passport. Um, and it's very straightforward. That is if you are over 18. If you're under 18, it's more difficult. Um, there is some limited provision for 16, 17 year olds. But the issue is if you, you, there's, you can only legally be male or female. You can't legally be non-binary. Um, and that would be a big issue for non-binary people in the country who have to essentially decide what legal gender you want to have, yeah. which is kind of like deciding what legal gender you look most like, because yeah. that's generally how your IDs work. Is like, And it's really dodgy if you don't appear to match your ID. Yeah. But so that's a big issue. And then if you, so if you are non-binary, for example, and you don't want to change your legal gender, but you do want to just change your name, you do it through a separate process called the deed poll, which is a very similar, like you fill in a form, you get a witness, you get notarized, send it off, you get it back. And then it, it costs money. I think it's at least 60 euro um, for the stamp duty. And then um, the deed poll you can use to change your public services card, driving license, etc. But you can't use it to change the name on your passport until you have two years proof of use of your name. So there's a weird gap there for people who only want to change their name that they then have a passport with an old name on it for two years. So it's relatively straightforward if you want to do the change your gender and then it's a little bit more complicated for the name. Yeah. And then also international students yeah. from countries like Canada yeah. who do use non-binary gender markers yeah. can face challenges in Ireland because yeah. then they also have to essentially pick a gender again yeah. that doesn't match the gender on their international yeah. um legal yeah. Documents and stuff. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so there's, 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 it's a weird fun with the final error. Um, sweet. Any other questions or anything? Yes. Well, I, I was, uh, I'm sorry. I'll tell you. <laughs> a fun game. You're in your eyes with the camera. You stand inside the yellow chair. Yeah. Of, uh, oh, I see. Some sorry. Yeah. Yes, yeah. The, yeah. So now we get to France students. Now, including trans students from day one doesn't mean day one of class. It means from the first point you are communicating with your students, which can start with, I understand now in fashion, it's in fashion to do pronoun circles. Mm -hmm. Those are deeply, um, not dangerous per se, but stressful, stressful environment for students especially when that involves them having to them having to actively seek you out and actively correct you especially for first year students or transferring students who may not know who to contact or may not be able to contact you until the start of the year so once you receive your list of students it's best if you send out a private surveyor form for disclosing name, pronouns, and any, any other identification that you need to know. But the main point here is to never put students on the spot, never make them take the impetus to correct you. Always begin by providing them with the opportunity. So that you are, because trans students are always aware of how they have to cater to other people's um, comfort levels. So if you initiate saying, I am comfortable with you correcting me, I am comfortable with using names that aren't on the paperwork set by the college, I am comfortable using other pronouns, then they in turn feel safer with you as an educator and as an authority figure. And this also provides a lot of clarification for you by giving the student as much space as possible to describe what they need you to know. As an educator, honestly, especially in large classes, you don't need to know everything about a student's identity, and that's okay. As long as you know what you need to in order to address them in a way that makes them feel respected, that's the important part. Another important part is that stu um, students, especially students who still live at home, students who are minors, aren't out to every, um, also students who are still working through their gender identity, aren't out to everyone in their lives. 
and may not be using the same pronouns or even the same name with everyone. So in these surveys, um, it would be useful to, um, for if, that, if the student was able to indicate if there's a difference between, if there are different times when they want you to use their legal name, like communicating with academic registry, um, academic registry communicating with parents versus in the classroom versus in one-on-one -on -one discussion. And to do this before you have to introduce the student on a class-wide or course-wide level, especially if you are singling students out in a group for any purpose, it's important that you are certain that you have the correct information in order to properly respect a student. The most important point here is to be conscious that gender expression and gender identity will change even in a single term of college for many students. So don't expect if you release this before the first day of classes that you are going to have the same answers from every student up and until they graduate. Per, um, keep these forms provided um, through the rest of term and make students aware that they can feel comfortable resubmitting that information to you and notifying you that they are changing how they identify and how they want to express themselves. Um, any questions? If I, the one challenge I have in with that is not a challenge, but in, in principle, is actually in action. So I would be lecturing a massive class, 400 students. So I wouldn't know, and I would barely know their names, to be honest with you. So that's one issue about even putting them through that, you know, why, why would they even need to disclose it because I probably won't be talking to them. So there's one part to think about that. The other is um, email addresses and when they're submitting things to me and I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm worrying about something that isn't uh, uh, something to worry about, but I'm just aware that there's so many students and you often don't know who they are. You know, and you don't want to disrespect anybody, but you're not, even if you ask somebody their preferred name, if there's something that is, you know, you see, you know, like I just sent an email, you see the email, you see the name on the email, you're going to go with that because we're trained to do that, you know, as in that try to be personable, even if you may not know the student. So do you have any, so I just try to be very, you know, try not to say anything, you say if, if you know, as the default, um, that type of thing, or is, is there anything else that you would have tips about that kind of point when you will not know the student because the class is so active? Right, that's why I suggest an online survey that students can attach their email to. That's what you can do in Google Forms. You can search it by the email of the person submitting because we understand that in-person introductions or even on paper introductions just aren't going to be useful with the scale of classes that most lectures have. So if you create an online form and students can submit the results to you with their email attached, if you have to email a specific student, you can search that form back that has the email attached. And because the often the services that let you construct these surveys um, send you the results. So you search for the email. The email is attached with all the student's description of their identity and the pronouns they use and the name they want you to use in their emails. Um, and so it makes it makes the process for you easier. You attach the link at the informational email at the start of the year before term starts. You get your responses. And then if you ever have to email a student, you just search up the specific email you want to um, contact. And then you're aware of the name the student prefers and their pronouns. Thank you. Of course, because we're aware that there are discrepancies between the names that are provided on a student email and a name that a student will often, even if a student just prefers to use a nickname, mm -hmm. or if a student wants to use a different last name, this can be useful for even students who aren't trans, who just prefer to be referred to in different ways. Mm -hmm. Because this, um, because changing your name with academic registry specifically mm -hmm. is a process that, while can be done without changing your name legally, 
is still difficult because it requires the student to go through their tutor and the academic registry office and often won't be completed until midway through the year. So we're aware that um, emailing in particular, especially groups of students, I've had situations myself where I have been addressed in an email along with other students, and that's how my legal name has been shared. So to avoid those situations specifically is why we want to preempt this with something that students can access all year instead of something you're handing out or something you're having to, or an introduction you're having to make with 400 or 800 students. Does that make sense? Or we did have a question, but we read it through. So, just if it's in a context of secondary school, so uh, mm -hmm. just asking in an anonymous survey, could we ask, would you feel comfortable to come out in X school or college? If you wanted to come out, have you been able to? A lead in the context of this question might be we want to understand the experience of people who wish to close their sexual identity, and if we have been able to support you, and how we can learn from that. Um, well, there's, I, oh, just to online, if they couldn't, could they hear you there? It's in the chat. The chat. The chat. Oh, okay, good. Um, firstly, I want to say, I ask what the purpose of the survey is, mm -hmm. and I want to remind everyone that sexual identity and gender identity are different, and in um, and impact students' experiences in college and secondary school in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um. I and there I mean, and coming out is on the spectrum as well, especially when you're trans. It can involve just changing your gender expression, like how you dress or what you choose to do about your body hair or other features, um, to changing your name, to changing your pronouns, to then changing your name and changing your pronouns legally is often considered a separate step from changing your name and pronouns socially. So I, again, I want to ask what the purpose of that survey is in specific. Um, if it's looking to just get a general sense of numbers coming from different secondary schools, um, and then that question could be more accurately answered. So, uh, clarify, we already use surveys to assess homophobic bullying in a school as part of the long term stand up. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think what, what I'm hearing from you is that this, this topic is perhaps broader than that can be generalized. And so, um, it really depends, and I think it's so insightful or, or helpful to be reminded how coming out in spectrum and how especially coming out as trans is, because you've just listed so many elements of the process there that one person might want to do one part, another person might be more comfortable starting another part. So I think that's really, really helpful that there is no one question that we're going to capture this mm -hmm. question, you know. Um, but also maybe um, for this particular individual, they can follow up with you and to ask more, uh, to kind of follow up more specifically, I think might be helpful. So we'll pop some um, emails in the chat there as well. Um, that course. might be helpful. Yes, you said, uh, they, yeah, you said right. um, that's helpful. So I'll pop your email address, uh, there, and will I pop key, key socks as well? Uh, yes, yeah. we can address this. Okay. Um, I just want to say, I say a survey here. Um, Honestly, I need a form of sorts. It's not really a survey for statistical purposes. Um, this would be for all students, not just trans students in particular. And it would be to serve all students, not just trans students in particular. It's just that this option is the most comfortable way to serve trans students' needs. Of course. Um, Non-binary students have different needs in the classroom than um, trans male or trans female students. Just because in order to include non-binary students, we have to consider how we gender our environment socially. And often, so the number one concern that we hear 
is gendered language being used to address students, like students calling you Mr. Last Name or Miss Last Name, or even saying boys and girls can exclude students who feel like they are outside the gender binary. And so there are many alternatives that people have been, excuse me, that people have been using even before this issue has been considered. So honestly, we advise to use the student's preferred first name instead of calling them Mr. or Mrs. last name. And then also to find alternative non-gender titles to addressing them. Also, when you're interacting with specific students, a shop, um, looking at a student and how they dress and how they act is not always an accurate perception of their gender or even the gender they're trying to express. So it is not a fruitful activity to try to guess at a student's gender, and it's honestly not respectful. I tell people all the time when I dress in like overtly non-gendered ways, I dress like this on purpose. And students are aware that they're dressing in ways that other people perceive as strange or other people perceive as outside um, the gender that they might be perceived as otherwise. So to condescend to them about how they're being perceived or to interrogate them about how you perceive them is just not useful as an activity, especially as a lecturer, because it just makes a student feel disrespected. And again, if a student presents one way um, one day and a different way the next, don't try to expect certain gender expressions of any particular student. Uh, this is often more towards um, lectures who have a closer relationship with specific students. It's just reminding how the teacher-student dynamic can um, make a greater impact when you make comments and how your students respect you and how you should be respecting them back by not interrogating them on their identity because often that's perceived as a lack of respect of their identity. Um, specific, there's also specifically, not just for non-binary students, but any trans student, because even in transitioning socially or transitioning visually, like your gender expression, there are stages, especially as hormone replacement therapy progresses or other sorts of gender affirming procedures progress. Just honestly, as a lecturer, it's not often relevant that you have to know the gender assigned of birth of every student you teach. And it's not relevant to their experience as your student. And if it is, you should be questioning why. Do you treat students of different genders differently? Do you treat students who are outside the gender binary differently? And is that why you feel like you're entitled to that information? So it's, it's just something to be aware of in your thought process and how you perceive and treat your students. And student, oh, yes, sorry. But so just on that note, I did have somebody ask me mm -hmm. if it would be appropriate to ask somebody what their you know gender assigned birth was As and I, I said to them I, I assumed not um because well what's that got to do with anything but um I wanted to ask you the same question you know so um yeah is it ever appropriate maybe is the question there or um I mean if you feel like you have chime in but from my perspective no if you're not interacting with someone on a basis where you have to interact with their external like sex, or yeah, um, often, even if you are interacting with someone where you have to interact with their external sex, there is no reason for you to know someone's assigned gender effort. Yeah. Like point um blanket state. <laughs> I just also was gonna add um, on a wider perspective as well. It's also um 
under the Gender Recognition Act and the Equality Act, you're also not allowed to, or you, I mean, you can ask if someone is trans, but they're not required to tell you. Um, so I also just wanted to make a note on that in terms of the specific legislation as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Well, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, but then there's also a question of even students who aren't like trans specifically, but are um, whose expression is different from the gender signed at birth. It's just generally, why, again, if you feel the need to know that information, ask yourself why, because no lecture needs to interact with a student solely on their gender assigned at birth. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, we've gotten, um, if we have any other questions before we proceed to the next portion. Okay. No, no, it's, you know, when I took your money for the letter saying, say, dear Sahan, yeah. it's not better for the gender critical uh, term for that. Or, like, say, a kid in a class and they tend to call me dear sir or me. Yeah. Is there a better word for that or something? I think on the letter, like maybe like to whom it concerns. Oh yeah, that's that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think it's good. Um, a, in terms of the, it's funny. Like so, sorry. The question was around using dear sir, madam in letters. Another thing is that I was saying maybe to whom it may concern might be better. And then the other question was around um uh, students, particularly maybe younger students, even like in school, in secondary school, like calling, yeah, calling. Look, well, I mean, there is absolutely a change in um, specifically the first year students in the transition from a secondary school environment to a yeah, yeah. third level environment. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I know in secondary schools, I call their teachers Mr. and Miss, whatever. You know, I don't, I don't know how they're getting on in, <laughs> in that regard. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I know in primary schools, they all call them teacher. Yeah, teacher yeah. no name. I mean, maybe like the sir and madam thing is less, but I don't know. Yeah. It's not the one you get for the situation. Yeah. Where sometimes they'd be like, I want to call people sir and madam. It's even a total look. Yeah, 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 you yeah. You start calling people, oh, sir, you're your ticket. Yeah. And then you realize it's a person you're not sure. Yeah. And then you're like, do I see sir or madam? I don't want everyone else, sir or madam. Yeah. Like, what do you call them? Something comes where they think it's rude. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. um, yeah. I would avoid it. I would avoid it. Yeah, 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 just um, yeah, when in doubt, just avoid gendered language. Yeah, um, for addressing people in particular in a third level environment, you can often say like professor or doctor, yeah. Yeah. those are always gender neutral terms. Oh, Best reason to get a doctor, yeah, I know, <laughs> absolutely. I hate being called Miss, 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 and all that stuff. You yeah. love the doctor, and um, for one reason alone, absolutely, I completely agree with you. I use colleagues, dear colleagues. Yeah, I'm a writer, so I do our dear students. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's how I go about it. Um, there's a question here. Um, I have seen pronouns used in emails where a person identifies as he, them. Yeah. Can you explain this? Yes. Do you also have a comment in the thing. I will read that as well. And just yeah. Or, uh, um, do you want me to go first and then you add whatever you feel oh, necessary? Yeah. yeah, the comment is, I love the idea of calling persons by first name. Secondary schools are still using Mr. and Miss to address teachers. And um, it would be a huge shift to start calling teachers by first names. Is that standard in university? Oh, um, I, I mean, I'm in humanities. So if anyone else in any other field that can correct me, but I, um, often our professors encourage us to call them by their first names. I like to call them. <laughs> no, that's true. A lot of people do prefer being addressed by their titles. And um, I think, uh, I think in emails, usually when you are emailing first, it is appropriate. I do that too. When I don't know the, the person, and then I will call them Dr. You know, Adderley, you know, and my first, and then they will see that I've answered, you know, regards mm -hmm. Irina, and they will then reply to that. And when they reply to me using their first name, I'll reply to them. Because there are some cultures that don't, mm -hmm. um, and that there are some cultures um, that it's always professor, and it's always you know that type of thing so just just in case again it's a cultural thing but yeah. because we've got so many cultural cultures among the um, lecturers here as well that's how i address it as a kind of a, as a colleague you know yeah. and then you go from there yeah and that's a great point even in terms of filling in around addressing people how they how, yeah. how they self-describe and if yeah. someone is almost giving you their first name to use then you're able to follow that and i think that, that ties in there um so in terms of the question around the okay. three they as a pronoun, do you want? 
Um, often, I know we haven't addressed pronouns much, but there are a variety of ways that people can describe their gender on a spectrum. And you, and there are a large variety of pronouns out there for people to use. You often, how do I say this? People often look through the options of pronouns that they have first and find what makes them most comfortable and then investigate what sort of gender identity those align to, right? Because right? some people will start like, some people start saying, oh, I like using they, them pronouns, but don't start, oh, I want to consider myself non-binary. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then they start investigating. So using he, they, I found is a way of describing a place on the spectrum that may be masculine aligned, but you're not a man at like the far end of the, again, gender is a spectrum. And so using different types of pronouns and using different combinations of pronouns, I've heard people who use he and she, people who use all sorts of pronouns, um, people who don't mind what pronouns people use, and people who use different pronouns in different social contexts. And those are the best shorthand ways for describing where on the gender spectrum you're most comfortable, because often it is a large range. So using, so in terms of actual usage, people do prefer if you, some people prefer if you switch between each usage, like you say, like they said that he went to, and you're still referring to the same person, but we understand how that might be confusing. So if people permit for two or more pronouns to be used for themselves, you can use whichever one you like. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, it's pronouns are, because pronouns often ascribe a specific gender identity, using conflicting pronouns or using a variety of pronouns is an effective way to describe that you are occupying a large space on the gender spectrum. I love that. That's great. Nick. Yeah. The only thing I would add is I think I think stylistically people usually would put like yeah. So you I think usually if people list more than one pronoun you can use either. I think typically my understanding is yeah. That people people choose the pronoun they prefer more. They put that, put that one's first. first. Yeah. So if you see like he slash they, it's like either is fine. I prefer he or like they slash she. I probably prefer that. I would. I. I personally would probably lean into the they in that sense, but use also she. Do you know what I mean? But I think generally you can use either. Is it when someone is when someone's offering them, yeah. Right, and especially if you see pronoun buttons too. Yeah. Those are popular, and though um, there are pronoun buttons that come with multiple pronouns. Yeah. Good. Any other questions from anybody? Oh, good. Um, I will. Uh, so next is more specific tips on different aspects of the curriculum that can affect um, that affect trans students and their experience in the classroom. So a big one is acknowledging and celebrating the accomplishments of trans people in your field. Seek out trans researchers, seek out, um, yeah, seek out the accomplishments of trans researchers and flag post them when you're talking about further readings, especially in subjects around gender. I'm aware this is a larger problem in humanities um, where there'll be theoretical discussions of gender. And if so, if you're providing further reading on those subjects, including and flag posting where you include trans researchers specifically is very much appreciated. But even in um, medicine and biology, in which anatomical gender and sexual uh, or anatomical like sex, but then also, or we'll come back to that point. But point is, if you find trans, um, if you find trans researchers who are doing research on matters of anatomical sex specifically or intersex issues, or even intersex researchers who are working on intersex issues, do flag post those and include them in further reading for your students so that your students can both get a greater or broader sense 
of how this is interpreted by a greater number of perspectives, but also so trans students feel recognized in their experience. And also correct outdated or exclusive language in learning material. We are aware that often learning material is used for a number of years, especially if you've been teaching since the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, um, even in text, like text, like secondary sources that you are assigning but have not written, do flag post um, outdated or exclusive language, just so people are aware of that. Because if you, if you don't flag post it as something you recognize as outdated or exclusive of trans students, Trans students will read you assigning that and interpret that as you being complicit with that outdated perspective. Because it's trans students have a justified sensitivity to all sorts of places that gender as a concept has in or like socially and culturally, because they have to be sensitive to those things in order to keep themselves safe. So making sure, even though in spaces in the past, trans people were not safe, in your classroom, with your readings that you are assigning, trans students will be safe with you. And they know that by you identifying places where they would not be safe in the past. And then of course, if you wrote materials in the past, say like the 80s or 90s or early 2000s, um, do go back and change the gendered language or exclusive language, like using transsexual. Often that's, as a general term, that's not very appreciated. Um, of course, any other sort of dated terms. Oh, and do flag posts for your students that the um, MLA 9 does now include using they, them pronouns as grammatically correct. That's fine. Like that's a specific, um, that's huge. Yeah. yes, no, you don't, um, using like he slash she or boy slash girl, that is also outdated exclusive language. So using person, using they and them pronouns um, should be the norm going forward. And if you're aware that was not the norm in a resource used in the past, do signpost or correct it. And um, is that just MLA or is that others? Um, um, it's Harvard and the APA. And yes, I believe they sh I mean, obviously you can research whichever specific citation method you want students yes. to use. Okay. You don't have to do our homework for the <laughs> No, no, but I'm saying if MLA, um, they released a statement about it. Okay. So I'm assuming if they publicized it, other citation methods will go forward using those same, because I don't see any reason why they wouldn't in all honesty. So a student using they, them pronouns to refer to people um, who they don't know the gender of or groups of people, it would be uh, exclusive to call that grammatically incorrect. <clears throat> yeah. You know what, I, I think I, I would definitely recommend checking though. I think there is definitely one that doesn't because my partner recently completed their master's thesis and it was sent back for corrections because they had referred to themselves with they as like the researcher. Wow. Yeah. Oh my Lord. So maybe check. check True. And check. do um. And then obviously or check. Which, yes. Obviously check which citation method you use and make sure that it's inclusive. Um. Again, we're um in the program that I'm in, we're encouraged to use whichever one you want. And uh, um obviously be best to give your students a choice of citation methods. But if there's a specific one for your field, then make sure that it's inclusive. There's a question. Yeah. Oh. So um, for teaching purposes, should lesbian, gay, and bisexual teaching be taught in the same session as transgender teaching or separately? I'm specifically thinking of healthcare teaching for the students. Oh, um, I think it depends. Depends on specifics. But students, well, obviously it's all under the same acronym. Mm -hmm. So if you, and they're obviously affected by a lot of the same issues. When you're talking about medicine, like HIV, um, the HIV crisis and other sort of, and often- It could also be healthcare seeking, um, you know, and other issues that, you know, how people, how might communicate with you if, if you are a healthcare professional, that type of thing. So it's not just about issues, it's about just healthcare with LGBT people, yeah. I guess. 
Um, I'm, I'm guessing that, but um, if you'd like to clarify further, um, uh, Donald, please go ahead. Yeah, we hosted a um, panel on trans healthcare specifically, just because there is such a variety of issues that exist with trans people specifically in healthcare. If you condense them all into one presentation, it would just be too large. Yeah, I mean, I also know that um, my colleague Noah is our healthcare officer at Tenney, and he does a lot of like trainings with healthcare professionals and also with um, healthcare students um, around like language and being conscious of obviously we're working specifically around trans issues, but like being conscious of the barriers for trans people accessing healthcare, particularly as you mentioned, like around like sexual health screenings and like all like, but I mean, loads, that's the one that comes to mind. Um, mm -hmm. But there's definitely specific barriers for trans people that are less present maybe for like lesbian, gay, bisexual mm -hmm. people. Um, and I think specifically because there's a relationship with the physical body that can be different or fraught in different ways um, than there would be necessarily for lesbian, gay or bisexual people. So um, I think it can be appropriate to do it all at once because I think sometimes we single out the T from the acronym and I and I like to, to keep it all in, in one, but again, being conscious that there are specific things. So I guess it totally depends. Uh, sorry, this is a vague answer on your what, what you're teaching and what is relevant um, in terms of looking at the barriers and in terms of looking then at the specific like um, interaction with the patient. But you can also you can reach out to Tenny and we have guidance around the language and all that kind of stuff as well. That's really um, insightful what you said, and I'd like you to go say a little bit more about mm -hmm. that. Just you said that you like when the T is included, mm -hmm. you know, that it's not it's, you know, it's separate. Yeah. So can you? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a balance in between, and this is, I'm going off personally now, I think there's a balance between recognizing that the gender piece is, is different to the sexual orientation mm -hmm. piece, but then also that we are often all part of the same community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think particularly in the current social and political climate, which is very hostile towards trans people specifically, and less hostile towards as being gay and bisexual people, that there is sometimes I worry about the tendency to single out the, the trans community um, and on, almost to isolate mm. us from other members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual community um, because that work is already being done so much by people who are transphobic or anti-trans um, and, and, it, and it is very commonly set up. Like, I, th I think there, there is a tendency to want to sow division there, um, you know, and we would see it particularly in the UK at the moment between lesbian, gay, bisexual communities and trans communities. Mm. So um, I think it's also important to to keep us all in a happy family as much as we can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's also important to consider that there are um, trans people who are heterosexual and, mm. and trans people who are homosexual, bisexual. Mm. And so lumping all transgender people in with um, queer people, it becomes yeah. difficult in general. There's a reason it's a very vague answer. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, even just going back to in terms of what we have right here on the slide around the curricula, so um, even speaking, I, I mean, we speak around like kind of medicine, biology and stuff. So, um, again, it's specifically in the healthcare context. Also, feel free to reach out to us um, or, or, or to Noah. Um, I can, we can give, a, give his email in the chat if we want. Um, but even just trying to be conscious of the, the gendered language that's being used around bodies, um, reproductive capacities, all that kind of stuff, um, and, and being conscious that, you know, not everybody who has a particular type of body identifies in a particular way. Um, I always try and default away from gendered language and into language that just describes what you're talking about, you know, so using just biological language, using, using just language around, say, menstruation or pregnancy without putting too much gender on it as much as possible. Now, I'm also conscious that, like, the vast majority of people who get pregnant are women, um, but trying as much as you can to kind of build in some flexibility there and um, also in terms of the philosophy history and arts piece and um, particularly areas where you might be looking at gender i know that i have done gender courses in university where we have looked at men and women only mm -hmm. um and feminism and you know all that kind of stuff and, and not included any trans voices or any kind of expansive ideas around gender so trying to make sure that we're looking at that too and then language courses as well so you know, we talk about using gender neutral language in English and using more gender inclusive language in other languages can be very difficult, mm -hmm. particularly in languages where they have really um, 
like gender downs and, and, and only gender pronouns um, as much as possible, maybe checking in with students around how they want to be referred to. Um, but even sometimes like there's lots of information out there around how all of this is evolving. Um, I can, I studied French and um, so I can speak a little bit around the French piece, but there are like now proposed um, French gender neutral pronouns. There's a lot of work happening in different areas, particularly in the grassroots level. Um, so that's also an opportunity for lecturers to develop their understanding um, and, and, and how that, all that is evolving as well. Um, but it, I mean, if you can, like if you know you have trans students in the class, and again, I mean, I'm thinking language courses are usually kind of smaller courses, particularly around oral language classes. So even just trying to check in with them around how would you like to be referred to in this class? Um, and we know that there's sometimes limited options. Um, but but even just naming that can be really useful in the classroom. So um, hopefully that helps around the language piece. Right, exactly. If you're looking to initiate contact with students and initiate asking them how they want to be referred, if you're a language um, lecturer, consider that there may be a way they want to be referred to in English and a way they might, might want to be referred to or may feel most convenient to be referred mm -hmm. to in the, in the learning language, especially if they're an advanced language student. And then also with exams, mm -hmm. um, take time with your department to consider not marking students down for using um, and educating yourself on non-gendered language in romance languages, but also other languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if students um, are using like fun new experimental pronouns, like maybe that's also part of their language learning mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, I, yep. I do have a, a little clarified here. Yes. Uh, thanks, because the transgender group also face additional issues. It can sometimes be easier to teach separately. Yep. Our national general practice guidelines are separate for LGB and T. Yep. Uh, but I agree with you. Uh, I, I, but I agree with what you are saying. Best not to single out transgender and to teach under one umbrella. Yeah. Yeah. It's a balance. All of it's balance. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any other questions around the curriculum teaching materials? Right. Is this also indeed best to not um, put students at a disadvantage or mark down students if they are using um, language outside your expectations of gender in a specific field? Like if a student is writing about hormonal issues and they say people with such and such estrogen levels or people who can get pregnant or people with these sort of sexual organs and you say no you have to say man or you have to say woman that is exclusive and trans students or any student does not deserve to be marked down for that because that isn't wrong great point okay pretty much lastly we have some do's and don'ts do we go through them. Um, so just kind of a roundup really of what we were talking about already. So in terms of the do column, sorry, I'm just your here. Um, in terms of do column, um, as we said earlier, do make mistakes. If a student, again, if you're in, you know, maybe like a, a tutorial seminar, like a smaller group where you where you would have students by name and all that kind of stuff, um, changes their name, changes their pronouns, you are going to make mistakes. It is okay. Take a deep breath, breathe in, breathe out. Try not to be so tense. Try to relax a little bit. Um, do your best to get it right. Do your best to practice. Do your best to move through that mistake making phase. But just know that you're going to and, and, and try to do your best in that moment to maybe a little apology um, and correct yourself and move on and don't do a big, huge, like make a big song and dance out of it because it's not necessary. So make mistakes and get corrected. Be open to being corrected. Be open to learning as well within the space. Um, and, and I think as well, um, something maybe we don't have on here as well is, is around, like if you make a mistake with someone's name and they are upset with you about it and you for you was a genuine mistake and you feel that they're having an overreaction, just try to maybe also have a little bit of patience because you know trans students and, and trans young people go through um, a lot mm -hmm. and it might not be about you it might be about all the other things that have happened to them that day or that week or whatever so just being open to that as much as you can and mm -hmm. um, sharing your pronouns if you are comfortable doing that in whatever way is good for you and um, if you can introduce yourself to your pronouns you can put your pronouns in your email signature you can put your pronouns wherever you want you can wear a little badge you can also just open up the door around the pronoun conversation so you know letting students know that they can come and talk to you if they want to use a different pronoun or a different name and um, as well as, as taking that information um, and kind of seeking out that information is really important right placing yourself as a figure who is comfortable with the current 
um, markers of expressing yourself as a person who is comfortable with just the concept of trans people and including trans students. Um, privacy and sharing. So, in terms of just being conscious that somebody's trans identity or any other kind of private information, I guess, is 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 private and confidential, um, in 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 any sense. But then also because of the specific climate around um around trans issues stuff at the moment, it's really important not to share unnecessarily or without consent that somebody is trans. Um, and being conscious of the of the need for informed consent when you are sharing information about people. And um, so, for example, if someone changes their name, making sure that you have spoken to them about who else they're using that name with, um, and where else they can use that name for you uh, going forward. Coordinating with others, so around like maybe your Erasmus awards, other lecturers, that kind of thing. Again, being conscious of where that name is being used and not being used. Um, respecting and practicing as much as you can. So get used to the sound of the name in your mouth, get used to using the pronoun in a sentence, say it out loud to yourself when you have ideally some quiet time um, and you can get used to it more quickly. Asking appropriate questions, please do, you know, um, in, in a time and a, and a manner that's appropriate, ideally not in front of everybody else, but, you know, making sure that you are understanding people correctly in the way that they are describing themselves. And then boundaries as well. So giving students space to not have to answer those questions too. And being conscious of your role in students' lives as well, in terms of somebody that is an authority figure um, and, and does in a, in a, in a very real and intangible sense have power over them um, and making sure that you're allowing students space for those boundaries too. And then we have our dot com. Do feel free to make mistakes and to be do be open to getting corrected, but don't make it a mo. But if you do make a mistake, don't make it into a moment where you're self-flagellating and over apologizing because that's putting the onus on the student to comfort you. Where this is a situation where you made a mistake. All, if you make a mistake with a trans student, all you have to do is say sorry and move forward, especially if it's a simple mistake, like using the wrong name or using the wrong pronouns. Don't make your mistakes or a trans student coming to you with a new identity into a teachable moment. Just that's not making that opportunity is not the responsibility of any trans student and it also makes again it's back to not sharing private information it just makes people incredibly awkward um generally i'm aware the pronoun circles are in fashion but often it puts people on the spot especially in smaller groups where they might know everyone just allow people to wear pronoun badges, allow people to introduce themselves to you, send out a form where they can introduce themselves to you privately, but don't make um, their corrections or your mistakes a public event. And also no inappropriate questions, please. If you wouldn't ask a cis student about their genitalia or about their hormones or about their medical treatments, or about their name, or more details about their name, or their pronouns. Don't ask a trans student, because as you'll see in the next slide, those inappropriate questions are revealing a lack of respect for that student, not just as a trans person, but as a person. And you are communicating to any other student who is there that you do not respect your trans students the same way you respect the privacy of cisgender students. Can I ask a mm -hmm. quick question, just what you said there about the pronouns and about putting pronouns in your emails, mm -hmm. you know, um, is it, does it help to signify ally? Yeah, ally? Yes. Is it, yeah. Is, yeah. yeah, definitely. It really does. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think it normalizes the conversation around pronouns and it normalizes the idea that we pretty much all have a pronoun. Um, and often we talk about pronouns when we talk about trans people, but everybody has a pronoun that you are used to people using for you. And the only reason that you don't need to tell people what your pronoun is is because you're used to people making the correct assumption based on how you look. It's usually what it boils down to. So trying to normalize the idea that we should share our pronouns, we should check pronouns with each other, all that kind of stuff is, is really great. And it also means that you know, maybe the only trans person in the room or the only trans colleague on staff or whoever it is, it's not the only person doing it. So yeah, we, rec we definitely recommend it. Yes, initiating yourself as the example um, when you have that comfort and safety as a cis person 
um, I'm assuming for you specifically, um, Dr. Dorina, but also to the audience in general a bit. Um, or well, again, if you have that comfort as a cis person, offer to make yourself the example or initiate that conversation instead of putting the impetus on trans colleagues and trans students. It makes it for a more inclusive environment and it signposts you specifically as an inclusive person for students and colleagues to come address issues with. Mm -hmm. So our main takeaways, trans students deserve the same respect you give to cis students in all parts of education. Students, um, will, this depends. When in doubt, ask for clarification on students' personal identity. What pronouns do, does that student use and when? Um, how do you want to refer to that student? Even if you're having um, in-depth discussions with students, what is their gender identity and their experience? Students are not there to educate you on trans issues and concepts in general. And it's also not their responsibility to be educated on all sorts of statistics and testimonials as to trans experiences in general. So you as the educator and the authority figure, it is your responsibility to educate yourself on these issues and to make yourself an example in the classroom in order to make your students more comfortable, which is why we hope you're here today. And we're really glad that you took the time to educate yourself here and to allow us to give you some advice. Yes. Is there anything you want to say? No, I think that's absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any last questions? Any last questions? Yeah, one of the questions yeah. on pronouns, actually, yeah. Yeah. but back to like when you were saying, Nima, would you, would you uh, recommend, because I, I would meet a lot of new students and do workshops and stuff with a lot of new students, and I, I generally would do to have a person, John Hannity, him. Well, you sometimes like forget what we do in court. Would, would you recommend that you do that in person? Yeah. Do, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. I do it. I do it as much as I can. Mm -hmm. I I almost generally recommend if you're comfortable putting your pronouns anywhere you put your name. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, so like when you introduce yourself, when you sign off your emails in your Instagram bio, I don't know, like all those kind of places is, is usually where I would try and put pronouns as well as putting names. Um, but yeah, I think, and I and I almost think it can be more powerful to do it out loud as well, and um, because you're having that in-person interaction with people too. Right, and that does open up the floor for students to yeah. then share with you, especially if you're doing specific workshops. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Well, it was a massive thank you in the event. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, great. Thanks everybody. You're welcome. Um, lovely. Um, in terms of if there's any other questions, you can email, something you can email myself, um, it's Dara, I'm Put it in the chat. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions as well around stuff. Yeah, amazing. Cool. Um, yeah. Thanks. More thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. And thanks for hosting us. Yeah. I'll let you do it. Yeah. Really, really cool.